Good morning and welcome to the roundtable to release two new reports on Agent Orange in Vietnam, which is a part of USIP's uh, War Legacies and Reconciliation Initiative for the last year. Uh, I've had the pleasure to work with uh, three authors uh, on two different reports, one about the uh, overview of the effects and uh, efforts to remediate Agent Orange and help victims in Vietnam, and the second looking specifically at U.S. assistance and programs that provide non-medical support to victims and families. Uh, two of the authors of these reports are, are with us today and will be sharing about uh, the contents and, and their experiences uh, in doing this research. Uh, First will be Phan Xuân Dũng, who is a researcher at the Institute of Southeast Asian Studies in Singapore. Uh, as a uh, young Vietnamese researcher, he's written compelling articles uh, about Agent Orange in Vietnam, its meaning um, in U.S.-Vietnam relations. Uh, welcome, Dũng. We're really delighted to have you here with us today uh, at the U.S. Institute of Peace. Uh, the second report was co-authored by Susan Hammond and Dan Quan Tuan. Um, Susan is the executive director of the War Legacies Project based in Vermont, which is a non-governmental organization supporting uh, families affected by Agent Orange, uh, both in Vietnam and in Laos. Uh, and Tuan, the co-author, uh, works with Project Renew in Quang Chi Province, Vietnam. Um, and Project Renew is an organization that was founded by the U.S. veteran Chuck Searcy and Quang Chi provincial counterparts to address UXO and, and other war legacies, uh, including Agent Orange. Uh, we will invite each of the authors here to uh, give an overview of their reports, and then we will have time for questions and answers uh, with the audience in person and online. There are two mics down at the front of the stage. And since we're starting later than planned, I think we will go over a bit into the coffee break and, and push the schedule back so there's enough time for discussion. And with that, I'd like to invite Zoom to start. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Uh, first, I would like to express my appreciation for the USIP and especially Andrew for entrusting me with the responsibility of preparing this very important report. Um, is a new and comprehensive analysis of Vietnamese Agent Orange victims, uh, and I hope that everyone will have the opportunity to read it later. And for the purpose of today's um, roundtable discussion, I will cover some key findings of my report. This slide on. Go ahead, we'll get it up. Yeah. All right. Um, okay, so my report, sorry. My report is based on a review of existing studies and also interview data that I collected in uh, 2022. Um, while writing this report, I visited the Vietnam Friendship Village in Hanoi, which provides home for children with disabilities associated with uh, Agent Orange exposure. And in this photo, you can see me and uh, some of the children at the village. The village um, was founded by a, an American veteran, George Meisel, who had served in Vietnam and later passed away because of health complications related to dioxin exposure. The village stands as a symbol of people-to-people -people reconciliation in Vietnam-US relations alongside many other examples of humanitarian work by Americans and American NGOs, such as Susan's um, War Legacies Project. However, um, in Vietnam, many believe that the US government has not done enough to reconcile with Vietnamese victims. So the purpose of my report is to make a case for greater efforts by the US government to address the needs and concerns of people affected by Agent Orange in Vietnam. 
um, their ongoing uh, suffering is a humanitarian tragedy that was caused by U.S. wartime action, and the U.S. can help to mitigate. And doing more on this issue will also enhance bilateral trust, which serves as a solid foundation for the Vietnam-U.S. Comprehensive Strategic Partnership. So um, first, let's start with who are Vietnamese Asian Orange victims. The majority of <clears throat> people who identify as Asian Orange in Vietnam live in central and southern regions of Vietnam, and that will spray with herbicides. But they also include northern soldiers who fought in the south and also their descendants. Um, there are currently four generations of Asian Orange victims in Vietnam. Um, the first generation includes those who were directly exposed to Agent Orange, and they experience chronic illnesses such as cancer and diabetes. Later generations include the, uh, the second, third, and fourth generation are descendants of the first generation and were born with very severe and often multiple disabilities. Now, obtaining the exact number of Vietnamese Agent Orange victims is an impossible task because of scientific limitations and many other unknown variables. So we can only rely on estimates um, to understand the scope of the issue. One, one estimate puts the number of victims at 3 million. Um, and there's another estimate uh, suggests uh, that there are about 1 million victims uh, including 150,000 uh, children with disabilities. But when we talk about people affected by Agent Orange, we also need to count family members, uh, people who have to deal with the financial, um, physical, and mental burdens while caring for affected individuals. And taking that into account, um, it is evident that the number of people affected by Agent Orange in Vietnam likely reaches into the millions, uh, even if we cannot provide an exact number. So what have been their experiences? Uh, in my report, I highlight several key themes uh, in this regard. Uh, the first theme is um, their social economic struggles. The health and disability effects of Agent, Oro uh, Agent Orange alone is already tragic, but many affected families also live in poverty um, and they lack access to healthcare services. Caregivers often have to forego stable employment uh, to provide full-time care for the victims. As uh, Mrs. Nguyen Thị Hong Tâm uh, told me, she had to quit her job as a tailor to take care for her daughter, who has severe mental and mobility disabilities linked to Agent Orange. And her family earns meager income uh, from a home-based motorbike washing business. And so they have to rely on government assistance to, um, to make ends meet. The second theme that I highlight in my report is psychological distress. Parents of um, victims often feel ashamed and socially isolated, even hiding their status as Agent Orange victims to avoid uh, communal judgment. And in many communities, disabilities often are attributed to fit or karma for past sins, the sins committed by themselves or their ancestors. And so this idea could lead to stigmatization and discrimination against the families. Caregivers also worry about their children's access to education, employment, uh, and medical care, as well as who will take care of their children when they, the caregivers, are no longer around. Children with disabilities often face bullying at school, which can lead to a loss of self-confidence and also suicidal thoughts. Um, as Võ Thị Kim Tuyến, a second generation victim, shared with me, uh, and I quote, when I was in school, other kids bully me, and I, I feel sad and quiet alone. I feel ashamed when they made fun of me. I thought about death. The third theme that I 
I mentioned in my report is the disproportionate impacts on women caregivers. Women not only bear the responsibility of caring for their families, but also can be unfairly blamed for the children's disabilities. Some cases even result in single motherhood as the husband leaves to have a new family. And this is what happened to Mrs. Pham Thi Zit, a single mother and caregiver of her 29-year-old daughter who um, has disabilities linked to Agent Orange. Mrs. Zit's husband, who was exposed to Agent Orange, um, left the family when the, the daughter was just three months old. For many victims and uh, family members, uh, Agent Orange is not just a personal pain, but also a collective grievance that demands recognition and compensation from its human perpetrators. So there has been an ongoing struggle for justice uh, led by Vietnamese, Vietnamese victims and advocates. This includes um, a lawsuit against chemical companies by VAVA, the Vietnam Association for Victims of Asian Orange, in 2004, and another lawsuit by Mrs. Chen Tô Nga, uh, a French Vietnamese uh, victim, in 2014. Now, this struggle for justice is driven in part because of a perceived double standard of the US government and Agent Orange producers who recognize and compensate American veterans who are affected by Agent Orange but has not done the same for Vietnamese victims. And what er what, what, um, whatever the eventual outcome of these legal battles um, for recognition and compensation, Vietnamese people affected by Agent Orange uh, will continue to rely on Vietnamese government support and also assistance from various international NGOs, uh, often with funding from the US government. Um, I will not go into the specifics of this assistance because I think Susan will cover in her, her presentation, uh, but I will provide a, um, a brief assessment of um, Vietnamese government assistance and US government assistance and provide some recommendations. Vietnamese government assistance can be categorized in two type, into two types. Uh, the first is preferential treatment for people with meritorious service for the revolution. And the second is general disability assistance. Um, the term people with meritorious service to the revolution refers to individuals according to the gov Vietnamese government um, have made significant contributions to revolutionary causes and Vietnam's development, uh, particularly during wartime. Vietnamese government assistance does alleviate uh, some financial burdens for many families, uh, but however, the monthly stipend provided um, is often considered insufficient to meet the needs of all families, especially those living in poverty. And for the policy um, for people with meritorious service to the revolution, it has not covered the third and fourth generation victims. And there are also many problems with the uh, uh, beneficiary identification process that uh, has caused some dis um, public dissatisfaction. Turning to US assistance, um, <clears throat> the US Congress has provided increasing funding to support health and disability programs in eight Vietnamese provinces. And a few days ago, during President Biden's visit to Vietnam, it was announced that there will be two more provinces, uh, at, leading to the total of 10 provinces. And the USAID implements these programs in the form of direct assistance, capacity building, and policy development. I want to highlight um, a notable development uh, which is the updated language in the appropriations bill um, on this issue. Now, until 2022, the language in appropriations bills um, was ambiguous about the connection between the uh, allocated funding and Agent Orange. Um, however, in the US Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2022, um, and uh, 2023, 
it is explicitly stated that funds will be used to assist persons whose disabilities may be related to the use of Agent Orange and exposure to dioxin. Uh, so I believe this is a positive development toward greater acknowledgement of U.S. responsibility. The programs themselves, the programs um, by USAID, are viewed positively by beneficiaries in Vietnam. Um, they are seen as beneficial to um, many later generations, um, later Agent Orange, um, later generation Agent Orange victims. However, they are still limited in scope, um, so it is necessary to increase funding and expand the current scope of um, existing services, particularly direct assistance because many affected individuals uh, do not have access to rehabilitation centers and healthcare um, facilities. But beyond health and disability assistance, it is also important to have explicit acknowledgement of Vietnamese Agent Orange victims, especially in official statements. Um, this is necessary to reduce the criticism of US double standard. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Finally, engaging in direct dialogue um, with the victims and their families is a necessary step toward greater reconciliation with the civilian victims of Agent Orange. Um, so what, what are the key takeaways from my report? Um, there are three points. First is that the number of people affected by Agent Orange in Vietnam may be as many as several millions, and their needs are both diverse and pressing. Second, despite the scale of the challenge, the Vietnamese government and increasingly the US government have sought to provide assistance to Agent Orange victims and their families. Third, much more remains to, to be done to assist and reconcile with the multiple generations of Vietnamese affected. Um, and to conclude, I would like to say that as the two um, countries, as the two governments enhance their ties, it is crucial not to leave war victims behind. Um, not just Agent Orange victims, but also victims of UXO and many people who are still looking for their missing loved ones. And so I hope that my report and also Susan's and Tuan's report will contribute to the discussion on how to, to ensure that uh, cooperation on war legacy issues is an integral part of Vietnam-US comprehensive strategic partnership. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Zoltan, for that uh, clear and uh, quite comprehensive overview of, of your report. I recommend everyone to look at it. Uh, I think seeing the statements from President Biden and General Secretary Nguyen Phu Cham uh, last weekend, uh, emphasizing the importance of this issue, uh, really this report and Susan's uh, do show some uh, of what's been achieved up to now, but also steps uh, for taking it forward um, into the future. Susan, over to you. Thank you. Um, as Andrew mentioned, my report covers the summary of the U.S. assistance um, in Vietnam for people who were believed to be affected by Agent Orange. But then we also, my colleague Tuan, went to interview 14 organizations that are primary, uh, they're focusing their work on providing non-medical assistance to families, so beyond the rehabilitation, which is the primary focus, really, of USAID funding. Um, so I'm just going to give a brief summary. Uh, uh, we have heard a little bit about um, USAID, but I'm going to give a little brief summary. But I first want to give a shout out to Michael uh, Martin, who we rely on his reports. And if you haven't read the CRS reports on US um, assistance on this issue, read them. They're still very valuable. Um, it gives a nice history of where we've gone on, on this issue over the years. Since um, 2000 and Seven, um, the U.S. has um, begun funding specifically to address the Agent Orange issue in Vietnam. And it took more than, unlike the unexploded ordinance issue, which we heard this morning started in the, in the 90s, earlier 90s, 
it took almost a, a decade, more than a decade actually, after the normalization of relations for the two countries to work together to how to address the problems of Agent Orange. And we could spend the whole day talking about that history, but we're really looking towards the future um, about where we are now um, on, this, on this issue. And in the beginning, as, as you mentioned, it really was not very specific. It was focused on addressing the related health issues um, around the people, communities that lived around the dioxin hotspots. And that was in the very early days where we were trying to basically define the, the full extent of the problems of Agent Orange. Um, but luckily, we had Senator Leahy and Tim Reeser putting money into the system and in a lot of ways forcing USAID to confront um, this issue. Um, and over time, as, as was mentioned, uh, the language has changed significantly um, to the point where it's much more direct to address um, people who are persons who, whose disabilities may be related to the use of Agent Orange and exposure to, to dioxins. So in the Senate language, it's very clear that the target of this USAID funding is for people believed in Vietnam to be um, Agent Orange victims. And as we said, it was very, it's very difficult to define who they are. Um, but the, because the US um, AID funding, by, by its nature, really, um, is, needs to be looking at disabilities regardless of cause, because you can't help one person with a disability and then ignore um, uh, you know, the person who has the Agent Orange related disability and ignore the other person in, who's their neighbor who also has a disability. So morally, you really have to approach it as a regardless of cause. But the language um, in the appropriations bills targets it geographically, which is I'm happy to see that another uh, two provinces has been added. So the US and over the years, the US and Vietnam have really began to, to fine tune how they're going to work together to address this, um, the disability section of, of impacts of Agent Orange. And as um, Daniel, uh, Ambassador Crittenbrick mentioned back in 2019, when this partnership really began to be developed, um, he says, our goal is simply put to improve the quality of life for persons with disabilities here in Vietnam. And in, in that expanded partnership on disabilities, the two governments agreed to cooperate to expand health care and rehabilitation services, expand the social inclusion and improve the quality of life of people with disabilities, improve policies and public attitudes, reduce barriers and increase social inclusion, and strengthen the capacity in the implementation of support activities. And so currently, the USAID funding, which is now at 30 million a year from the beginning of 3 million, um, is channeled through several organizations. Um, two are American, uh, two are foreign organizations, the Humanita Humanity and Inclusion, which is really working on the, the capacity building of the rehabilitation sector. And then Vietnam Assistance to the Handicapped, who also um, works in that field, but it re also has been done a lot over the past several decades to help the Vietnamese expand, uh, develop, and implement their disability, law and disabilities. And then there's five, currently five Vietnamese organizations that are the primary recipients of, of the funding, though there are many sub-recipients like Project Renew, who I worked, uh, worked with on this paper. Um, as we said earlier, much of the funding has been focused on improving rehabilitation services in Vietnam and helping the Vietnamese develop it and implement the law on disabilities. And although they are, uh, oh, so I skipped it. The Vietnamese government has also made great efforts, um, as was summarized earlier, um, partly for f passing the, the, the law on disabilities, but also creating this support system through um, through the Ministry of Labor and uh, Social, I always get that mixed with the Social Labor, Ministry of Labor and Social, and social Affairs. Affairs. I get always mixed up with the, the Viet the Lao version of it. But, um, and so there, there's this monthly stipend program that if you are certified as a person with a disability who has a severe or very severe disability, and as Ong mentioned, it's not, it's the families 
welcome this assistance, but it's not sufficient to address all of their needs. Is it the 2016 uh, National Survey on People with Disabilities in Vietnam found that households with disabilities are twice as likely to live in multi-dimensional multi poverty in Vietnam. The greatest impact is on the quality of their housing and sanitation, and the likelihood of children not completing school, and these deprivations are greater in the rural areas of Vietnam. 80% of the people with disabilities in Vietnam live in rural communities. So they have a uh, difficult access to the medical care that is existing, but the, uh, the impact of disability tends to be more severe um, when you're living in a, in a rural community. Also having a, a family, a person with a disability in your family is shown to increase a family's cost of living by 12% due to the increased cost of medical care, transportation, food, personal care, and many other expenses that come with caring for a family member with a disability. And often it require, if it's a child with a very severe or an adult in some cases, some of these children we're talking about are now in their 30s or 40s. They, they often require a full-time caregiver who therefore cannot work outside the home, cannot contribute to the income, um, can't even go to the, um, into the fields to farm. So programs that are focused only on, on the medical side of disability, I mean, though they are very welcome and very needed in Vietnam, they do not address the impacts of disability that affect the whole family and make it difficult for families to move outside of this financial or multi-dimensional poverty. And so our report looked at, at 14 different organizations. Many of them were chapters of the Vietnam Association of Victims of Agent Orange who have a, uh, programs in probably almost every province now, I would assume, in, in Vietnam that are providing some working directly with families who have victims, uh, who are, have family members with disabilities, particularly those believed to be impacted by Agent Orange. So the Vietnam Red Cross is another organization that has a na nationwide um, impact because they have, both VAVA and the Vietnam Red Cross, have volunteers often down to the very local village level and even smaller level in that in some cases. So they have really developed direct relationships with the people with disabilities in their community. So they are well, both VAVA and the Red Cross are very well placed to provide programs that are providing direct assistance to families or caring for severely disabled children. Um, and our interviews found that in the non-medical side of the equation, there are, these programs tend to fall into six main categories. Livelihood support, which it could be helping families um, develop uh, livestock, um, breeding, setting up a small business in their home so the caregiver does not have to leave the home improving the living conditions um, when you have, uh, particularly in, in areas where <laughs> many of these people live, where there's uh, the rainy season and the monsoon season that comes through and the typhoons that come through, there are um, homes that are in vast need of safe um, housing, uh, roofs that won't leak. So many of these organizations help in that, that aspect. Um, educational support, even though there are, um, if you're a child with a disability, you can get tuition uh, reduction, you can get scholarships, but those don't cover the full cost of um, an education. You may, you may need transportation to get to and from school, and that can be difficult if you're a, someone with a physical disability. But also, some of these organizations provide support to the siblings of children with disabilities because after they will be the ones who will need to provide the caregiving for their, their disabled sibling um, when their parents pass on. And so to help with that, um, ensure that that child stays in school so that they can have a, a, a decent job upon graduation so that they can have, ideally, have some of the resources that are needed to care for their disabled sibling when their parents pass. 
Um, some other organizations provide just financial assistance for either an emergency situation that comes up or um, just cash assistance to help them um, deal with a medical, medical trip or um, you know, if they have some, they lose a job and are in a situation where they need cash on hand. So there's some organizations who will provide that type of support. Um, caregiver training and support, which USAID has also provided, but the Red Cross, NVAVA, and others have worked by training their network of local volunteers to provide, to assist caregivers um, in providing better care for their children with disabilities or providing some respite care even so the mother can go off to the market. Um, and the others' um, programs work on providing social integration and peer support and helping people with disabilities integrate into their, their local committee, uh, community. In addition, a few of the programs, and I want to shout out here to the uh, Children of Vietnam's Hope System of Care, work in collaboration with multiple government agencies and organizations to provide more comprehensive wraparound services to people with disabilities and their families. And since about 80% of the people with disabilities live in rural families, many of these programs come out in the form of the first, which is the livelihood support, um, and often in the form of raising uh, cattle, um, water buffalo. Um, and these can be challenging um, because it's not, you can't just take this cow and hand it to a family and expect everything to go well. I mean, you really have to be engaged with the family from the very beginning. You have to bring um, the veterinary services there from the very beginning to, to make sure that that animal is, is healthy and that they can go, they can breed and, and go through the, um, the purpose of why they're there is really to, to have increased the family's li live, livestock um, supply. Um, and without that direct hands-on um, support, there can be a lot of failure. Um, but if you have um, this program where you invest, the, the families are invested in in the, um, the livestock by in, including in their own investment, whether it's building the stable or um, helping to purchase the, the animal, there's more, uh, more success that has been found. And then the number and scale of these programs that we looked at with the, um, the 14 organizations are pretty limited because they are, they are, their funding tends to come through individual donations, particularly when it comes to VAVA and, and the Red Cross. It's, um, donations that they are able to generate in, in the local community or in some cases internationally. And so they, they can ebb and flow. There's no, there's no sustainability at this point. They're pretty, um, uh, depending on what funding is available at, at the time. So there needs to be more sustainable funding sources targeted at this type of, of support. Um, and as Ambassador Crittenberg noted in 2019, the U.S. and Vietnam are working together to create a comprehensive service system that supports caregivers as well as a person with disability. And so far, USAID has done a pretty good job. I mean, I, I can critique some of their things, but overall, they've been a very good job on the, on the rehabilitation side and the, and the disability rights side of these issues. Um, but I think there can be more efforts over time to reach what Ambassador Crittenbrink also mentioned, connecting people with disabilities and their families to economic and social support, and particularly that economic support, because having a child with a severe disability is an economic strain that impacts the whole family. And so I, I was, when I was completing this paper, I was happy to read that the USAID is doing some pilot projects in this field, and maybe we can hear from Tony about some of the successes there and the lessons learned and how we can move this forward more. Um, and on an individual level, these are just a few uh, examples of some of the livelihood um, support. and educational support. Caregiving, training. So 
So on an individual level, these programs are not, it's not a huge amount of money. It, it depends on the type, type of program, obviously, but for um, scholarships and small loans, up to, uh, that can be $100, $250 per family. Um, for building, helping renovating a home, which is a huge need as well, it's more around the range of 2,000 a family. Um, the animal husbandry that I talked about is usually in the $20 million, $20 million dong range, or about 340 to 860 per family, depending again on the type of livestock that you're helping them with. Um, and then some of the more wraparound services that the children of Vietnam provide and others, um, the investment is around 1,000 per family, not including, of course, you know, the, the management costs that are involved in that. So I, think, I believe that scaling up these projects can be possible if there's more cooperation between the implementing organizations and local government officials. And there is already a framework in place in Vietnam for the, called the Action Plan on Disabilities from 2021 to 2030, which, oops, which kind of outlays how each ministry and each organization can work together to, to, and set concrete goals in order to improve services and support people with disabilities. So there's a plan in place. The, the issue is trying to work, how do you filter in some of these um, individual organizations and efforts into the greater plan to provide uh, more sustainable direct assistance to people with disability. And so if the next round of appropriations remains at 30 million, which we, we hope it does, I mean, that investment in the future can, if that can be transferred not just to the medical programs that are in the, in the pipeline, but some of these additional support that families need beyond medical care, we can go a, a great, uh, a long way in addressing um, some of the economic support that is needed, uh, needed for these families. And again, as we don't really know the full extent of how many people we're talking about, um, though there are surveys on disabilities in Vietnam, and we do have a sense of how many have severe or very severe disabilities. Um, and if you target it geographically to the areas where there are, um, where we're working now, um, in the provinces that were sprayed, we're really talking an estimated population of about 73,000 or more, uh, around 73, 74,000 people with disabilities. And if your le average level of support is 500,000, I mean $500, I'm sorry, you, with that 30 million that the US is already allocating at hopefully per year for the next several years, if some of that can be put into these programs that are non-medical assistance, you could really make a difference in those 73,000 families. So in conclusion, oops, I didn't put this one on, sorry. Um, one of my conclusions of my paper, that, our paper, is that one of the priorities is to de devote more resources, time, and attention to providing non-medical support for persons with significant disabilities. In addition to, this isn't excluding what has been done in the rehabilitation side of things, but in addition to what has been done in the rehabilitation side. The second priority is to foster more and closer collaboration between Vietnamese government agencies and Vietnamese international NGOs in order to provide more wraparound services for people with disabilities. And third is to fully engage people with disabilities and their families in the programs that support them, and that, that was your recommendation as well. You have to really bring the people into the discussion. You can't just bring the program to them. Um, thank you. I'll end here with, if you want to read the quote from uh, Ambas uh, the, um, Samantha Power. Great. Please join me in uh, congratulating Zoom and Susan uh, for their work and, and presentations this morning. And I'd also like to thank the USIP publications team that we've been working mm. with to uh, get these reports uh, finished and printed. Um, 
according to one of my colleagues, USIP produces a large number of reports on many different peace and security topics, but these reports have special meaning and the chance to be, I think, really go-to sources uh, for understanding Agent Orange issues in Vietnam uh, for years to come. Um, so they were also quite moved by what you've done and, uh, and these issues that we're talking about. Um, I'd like to ask the first question and then we'll open up for, uh, for everyone else. Uh, at a workshop that USIP organized with the Diplomatic Academy of Vietnam several months ago, uh, Charles Bailey, former Ford Foundation and Aspen Institute uh, leader, uh, stated that he thought that key difference uh, in the U.S.-Vietnam reconciliation process compared with any other post-war uh, relationship is actually the Agent Orange issue. This is a unique feature between the U.S. and Vietnam. Uh, and there are many reasons for that, right? One is that it affects both people and the environment around them. It's hidden and unclear in its effects and its causes. Um, we're still finding out what some of the impacts might be. And the fact that it affects U.S. veterans as well as uh, people throughout Vietnam. Uh, I'd be interested in your reflections on what role the Agent Orange issue has played in U.S.-Vietnam reconciliation and getting us to this new comprehensive strategic partnership. Who'd like to start? You want to start? Yeah, I can start first. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, uh, I, I've worked with Charles Bailey closely on this report, so first I would like to ex extend my appreciation uh, for him. I wish he could be here today. Um, and as I learned about this issue, as I, do, as I did research on this topic, it was the most difficult war legacy issue mm -hmm. in Vietnam-US relations because of the reasons that you mentioned. Um, for many years, even after normalization, the two sides could not agree on the science, on the basic facts. Um, and so that state of um, deadlock persisted even, we have, even as we have formal relationships. But I think what, um, what led to the progress was the initiatives by a lot of um, people from both sides, both from the state sector and the non-state sector, working together because they realized that it is a humanitarian issue that uh, we need to do something about. Right? It affects not just Vietnam, uh, but also the US and also veterans from other countries. Right? So it's a shared humanitarian issue that connected us. And, and because of that, we had you know, a lot of initiatives that led to scientific discovery uh, of the hotspots. Um, and then we talked about science. We began to talk about science. Right? Before that, we just, um, the issue was mired with you know, politics and emotions. So it was very hard to reach a compromise. But then we discovered the science, and we also recognized that you know, the science might not be perfect, but we, it's something that we can work with. And we do see that there are a lot of people in need. So let's, let's combine that together. Right? We have some science, um, and we also have the you know, compassion to do something about it. Um, and then we can compromise and work together. Um, and it, sh it demonstrates that, you know, we can, it's the most difficult issue, and we overcame that. Um, and so I think it shows the strength of U.S.-Vietnam relations, of U.S.-Vietnam reconciliation, and it shows that, you know, people from both countries are willing to work together to deal, to confront with lingering uh, war legacies. Yeah, I would agree with that. It's been... Um, I think very important because it was there was just so many throughout that earlier days that the two countries just could not figure out how to discuss this issue in a way that can address the humanitarian problems that we, everyone was seeing the humanitarian issues we couldn't agree on on 
defining what was causing it necessarily, but there was certainly in a sense of we got to um, help these people who were impacted by the war. Um, but it really took, I mean, I, I think we really have to thank Tim and Senator Leahy for being so persistent in and in evolving that language over time to the point where it was really forcing USAID, you know, the administrative side, to, to reach out to this population that the Vietnamese, they, they weren't questioning the science. For them, they were a victim of Agent Orange, and that victim, they were victims because of the war caused by, by the US. Um, but through Senator Leahy and Tim and Charles, who also really you know, finessed that language in a way to get um, the programs to more reflect what um, the Vietnamese, the, the people that the Vietnamese wanted helped, which are those who were perceived to be or were believed to be or are victims of Asian Orange. You can, it's, I, I kind of hesitate because it's hard. You get stuck on the science, like you say. It's like, because you cannot prove that one individual person has you know, this disability due to that Agent Orange. I mean, the science shows that in animal studies quite clearly, but it's, it, that was that stumbling over the language, which I still do today, was causing a lot of these problems. But they, we worked it out. The US and the Vietnamese worked it out. They found a way to address this really controversial, both scientifically controversial and just politically and scientifically uh, controversial issue. And I think that's it's a good example of what can be done in other, other countries to develop, to tackle some of those problems of, of where you just can't see um, to find a, a way to have a common language on it and then, or agree in a way to um, stop debating over the language and just doing the work that needs to be done to provide assistance. Great, thanks to you both. So we welcome comments and questions uh, in the discussion. Um, please come down to one of the two mics here in front. Um, who would like to go first? We welcome questions in Vietnamese as well. Please. Hi, uh, Scott Willis from Children of Vietnam. And uh, I want to just say thank you, Dung and uh, Susan, for these reports um, and uh, for continuing to draw attention to this really important issue. Um, and thank you, Susan, for the shout out to Hope System of Care for uh, the program that we run. It was, in fact, Hope System of Care that drew me to Children of Vietnam back in 2014. So I'm very proud of the work that we do. Um, my, my question is this. Well, first, I want to say that um, I think what, what's happening you know, with respect to Agent Orange and, and the treatment of people with disabilities is, is making great progress. I mean, if we look at the 2022 and 2023 language in the budgets, right, you, you've got in, you know, first of all, it went from 20 to 30 million, and you're actually saying the words Agent Orange, right? Mm -hmm. So this, these are milestones. I mean, I think we have to acknowledge that, right? So of course, there's still work to be done. But, um, you know, and, and when we look at the infrastructure, uh, albeit it's, it's, it's small and, you know, limited to certain provinces, like we're in Quang Nam, you're in Quang Nam, but you're working with Red Cross. We have our local stakeholders and partners that we're working with. So, you know, the model is there. It just needs to be expanded. So in Vietnam, I think at least, of course, it can be bigger and more, but it's, it's on track, right? Mm -hmm. My question to you, Susan, I know you're very active in Laos and looking at the issue of dioxin contamination there, and I'm just wondering, when you think Laos is going to be ready to kind of begin this journey, right? Mm -hmm. So we've got a 1.5 million there versus 30 million for Vietnam. It's obviously a smaller scale in Laos, that's, that's, I got that, but you know, I, we're not really doing anything there, I think in terms of remediation, in terms of helping people with disabilities. Just wanted to get your thoughts on when you think Laos will be able to get on the train. Thank We're you. getting closer, okay. <laughs> so that's good. And first of all, the language is in the last two appropriation bills, 1.5 million. Um, in Laos, the problem is, is somewhat different because the, um, the primarily the spraying that took place in Laos or in the, the, the spine along the, the border between Vietnam and Laos, um, very rural communities, um, 
mostly ethnic minority communities that don't have access to health care to begin with. Um, so um, even identifying how many people have disabilities that may be related to Agent Orange is, is challenging. I mean, my organization in Laos, we go village to village in, in the districts where we're working. Um, and we do find the same types of disabilities, the same um, percentage per, um, population-wise that you see in, in across the border in Vietnam. And the Lao know, particularly the border villages, they know that Vietnam is receiving this assistance from the US government. They're, they're well aware of it. Um, but things move very slowly in Laos. And we are now, um, as far as I know, the last I talked to USAID, which was several months ago, they are hoping to develop a program um, to reach those rural communities, the rural districts that were sprayed, um, hopefully having some type of um, program in place by the end of the year. They have a strong disability program there now, but they're not in these more remote areas. Um, so we're hopeful that, that that will start to phase out and they'll be able to utilize the funding that's in the, the pipeline right now, which is a total of $3 million. On the dioxin hotspot side of the question in, in Viet, I mean in Laos, that's um, more challenging because of the secret nature of the war. We there is no Da Nang or Binh Hoa, no large um, military bases where millions of these barrels were stored in Laos. There, we're talking about much smaller um, bases that the CIA was operating out of that we have heard from CIA. Um, alumni, you know, Air America, former pilots, that they do, did have barrels of herbicide, whether it was Agent Orange or something else, they're a little unclear. Um, but for the dioxin hotspot, that's where science is very simple. You, you go in and you test and you analyze the soil. And if it's a, there's a dioxin problem, then we know ways to remedi remediate that. But there's still a lot of sensitivity in Laos um, about these sites. I mean, these were, um, you know, former CIA bases like Long Chan, um, which are still sensitive areas today in Laos. So, so getting that um, moving forward on the remediation side is is challenging, not only because the Viet the Laos are hesitant, but the U.S. Embassy, to them, it's not a priority either because it's pretty small. Um, so we're still moving, trying to push that a little bit further, but it's slow steps on the remediation side. If I can add to that, when I was in Laos a month ago uh, with Sarah Kulabdura, uh, we met with several of the Lao government's officials from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs who had recently gone to Vietnam on a study visit that uh, Susan's uh, organization sponsored. Uh, and uh, they visited some of the hotspots and areas affected in Vietnam. It seems to me that that has increased their interest mm -hmm. and uh, uh, perhaps they're ready to speak more about uh, Agent Orange issues yeah. in Laos. And also from, from USAID, I met the mission director uh, in Vinh Chan. Yeah, so they have this existing OCARD project which is supporting people with disabilities in several provinces and their intention with this uh, additional appropriated funds is to expand that to several provinces in uh, central and southern Laos uh, that, that, that were sprayed. So that's sort of a comparable strategy to the one that USAID has uh, carried out in Vietnam, first geographic targeting. Mm -hmm. uh, but then, as you say, it's a question of, okay, it's in that geographic area, but what places exactly and, and how to reach and best support the people affected yeah. there. And in particular because unlike in Vietnam, which has a quite robust a medical system in place at quite many levels, this area of Vietnam, I mean in Laos, there's, there's nothing really set up. I mean, you have, if to get services, rehabilitation services, you would need to go all the way to Vien Chan, um, which can be an eight to overnight bus ride. And first you even have to get from your rural village to get to the bus. And so there's a lot more complexities in providing services to people with disability in Laos. Who would like to come up next? Uh, 
Uh, hello, good morning. Thank, good morning. Thank you so much for the uh, presentation. I was just curious, um, I mean, you all made such uh, brilliant and insightful recommendations about what needed to be done to move this uh, effort forward. And I was just curious to get your take on the kinds of strategies or approaches to um, get people's awareness or support to that place where that kind of action can 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 become reality, particularly when it comes to just communication or I think you were at the session yesterday in discussing, you know, the arts or the role of the arts and these types of initiatives. So I'm just curious to get any ideas about just channels or, you know, approaches to build greater awareness or greater support. Lance, do you want uh, to not, introduce yourself for a minute too? Sure, sure. I, I, selfishly, I, I'm a filmmaker. My name's Lance Kramer. And so I spend my, my time thinking about storytelling and the arts and its role, you know, in, 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 in working towards, you know, peace and reconciliation. So I'm not only interested in film, but um, I would love to just get um, your recommendations. And not just, you know, in the, I mean, I think I'm interested in government and NGOs, but also just amongst, you know, the general public in both, in both cultures or both countries. Thanks. Well, I think your paper did that very well in a lot of ways in, in getting the voices out of the families who um, just understanding the day-to-day -day reality, you know, the, the waking up, the preparing the meal, the feeding the child, which can take an hour or more. Um, and then, then there's the, the bathing. And I mean, it's just, it's for some of these people that, that you spoke with, um, with very severe disabilities, I think get for someone who is, does not have that experience of, of caring for a child with severe disabilities, I, I don't think you under, it's hard to understand the intensity of, of that and how it impacts the caregiver and the family. And so I think finding ways to get those stories out, and your paper does, uh, helps to do that. Um, in Vietnam, um, I think if you mention Agent Orange to any Vietnamese person, they would know what you're talking about, and they would get in their mind a vision of, of who that um, person is um, and the impact on that family. Because there has been a lot of, thanks to a great extent to the Vietnam Assistance of Victims of Agent Orange, to VAVA, who have, who have that, who are working directly with these families and helping tell their, their stories. Um, but then moving that into policy, um, that's very challenging um, to do. But I, I mean, there's, there's the will there, I think, but it's just, it's a lot of it, it's the techniques. How do you actually do it? How do you, how do you go from that $30 million that's allocated by Congress to a program that's going to reach that family um, that was described um, in your paper, who's um, overwhelmed by the burden of caregiving and, and deeply in poverty? Uh, yes, so one of, the theme that, one of the themes that I mentioned in my report is um, psychological distress that comes from the reactions of people in the community uh, because disabilities or disabilities linked to Agent Orange um, is, can be seen as, as a curse. It's, it's not perceived as, okay, this is human action and these people are suffering the consequences, but you also have cultural belief mm -hmm. that this is God's decision. God, God decided that this family deserves that because you know, they did something in the past. Their ancestors did something in the past life. Mm -hmm. So people have this rumor, okay, so this family, they did something bad, they deserve that. So I think it's important to raise community awareness. Um, and I also think why is it so important to have acknowledgement that, okay, this is something that the US Air Force did, right? And these people are suffering the consequence. That's why we need clear language to say that, okay, this is not your fault, right? This is a mistake that happened. Um, there needs to be people to take responsibility for those actions. And so I, I think, you know, we should replicate the language in the appropriations bill that we are supporting people with disabilities that might be related to Agent Orange, right? Um, to show that, okay, so, this is not fit. This is not karma for your actions. This is a world tragedy. It is ongoing. And the US is doing something to address that. I think that's very important. Thank you. Thank you. 
Megan, do we have questions or comments online? Not yet, okay. Um, just to kind of expand on that too, with, I mean, it, like I said, in Vietnam, people understand the impacts of Agent Orange. It's been in the papers, it's been, um, there's been movies, there's a lot of um, fundraising done to support the victims. That's not the case in Laos at all. Um, it's the people who were um, impacted are very remote. They know, they recall the planes, they talk about the spraying. Um, they don't link though that that spraying that was done 50 years ago may be the cause of the disability in, in their family member. There's, they, there, is that, there is not that link in Laos at, at, at this point. Could I invite our colleagues from VAVA or USAID if you'd like to share your thoughts? Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Andrew, to invite her to have some comment. And uh, first of all, I'd like to say thank you very much for your seat. This time you uh, organized a one round table about these subjects. And for these subjects, uh, we agree with the uh, study and survey from Susan and uh, Mr. Zung here. Um, we understand that it's really difficult to find out the number of the victims, as you said, and it is uh, really difficult to to find out how many of the people now, because as Zung said, it is they have uh, some emotion about themselves, and they don't want to show that they are the victims. So that's why during the way that we find we want to survey about that one is not easy, even from outside. And um, the second thing is difficult is we have no finance to do this for all our provinces in Vietnam. So that's why. We uh, need the help from, uh, um, from the U.S. first, and uh, that's of course. And for the programmers, we know that with this uh, uh, program and with you uh, can put it on, on, online, then it's very useful for us. Because from here, we can let everyone to know how about our victims and how about their life now. It's very difficult in Vietnam, and they always say that it is a poorest and difficultest in our countries. And so uh, I think so with your research, it's very, very useful for everyone if they uh, can present here and they can understand more about that one. And I would like to say thank you again for your uh, try to do everything for hours during the days and I think during the times uh, and before and in the future. And we hope that in the future we have uh, many actions for them and uh, for the new relations between the two countries. And as um, Mr. Uh, Jeff uh, McClay talked about this um, morning, and uh, we hope that uh, they are continue to this uh, policy that we are doing for us. And um, we hope that uh, um, in the future it is, will be better for everyone about it. Thank you. Thank you, Chi Kang. Mai Kang is the head of international relations uh, at, at VAVA. And also uh, with us today is uh, General Min Van Ring, who is the president of VAVA. He'll be speaking on the, uh, the closing plenary this afternoon. Yeah, and I think one sort of um, symbol of how this relationship has strongly developed is that USAID is working with VAVA now. Um, as a subgrantee, I believe, right? Um, and that before it was, VAVA was sort of like, they're here doing their advocacy, um, kind of separate from what the US government was doing, and now they're, they're really starting to work better um, and more closely together, and I think that's very promising because VAVA has such a reach throughout the whole country for this population that we're really targeting, which is the victims of Agent Orange. And I should add that in addition to uh, this session being uh, translated and, and live streamed in Vietnamese, um, we will be translating both Zubm and Susan's reports into Vietnamese. Um, that's not ready yet, but uh, it will be coming out and will be uh, available online.
I think we'll go for another 10 minutes. So we do have time for several more comments. Yes, sir. So uh, I am Michael Martin, and thank mm -hmm. you, Susan, for your comment earlier. Um, this has been an issue that I've been dealing with when I was at CRS for about 15 years, and it was actually uh, Representative Falio Maviega of, of, of America Samoa, who held the first congressional hearing on Agent mm -hmm. Orange. And in that hearing, he himself found out that he was potentially a beneficiary of the program that the United mm -hmm. States had for veterans. Um, so that was sort of an interesting uh, detail at the hearing. Uh, that I found out. But that leads me into one aspect that's in the language and has been around for a while that often is looked past. Uh, you've been talking mostly about disabilities, and indeed disabilities has been a word that's been used. But it also talks about health care. Mm -hmm. And it's very sensitive politically, um, both in the United States and in Vietnam. I know on the Vietnamese side, at least through my interlocutors, that they look at the presumed exposure programs that the United States has that provides to US veterans health care for multiple diseases, including type 2 diabetes, which is what Representative Falima Viega had. Um, so far, you have seen a great reluctance on the US side to actually activate that health care side. It has been USAID focusing almost exclusively on disabilities and trying to disentangle or disengage it from the Agent Orange exposure part of it. And there's been kind of a delicate political dance on how it gets brought in, but not explicitly. So one of the things I was off, I've often pondered about when I was at CRS, I, couldn't, I could ponder things, but I couldn't propose things. Mm -hmm. Now I can, now that I'm retired. But can either of you see a way that something parallel to the presumed exposure program in the United States could be brought into the provision of assistance by the United States in Vietnam, for example, to um, veterans of the conflict on the Vietnamese side who have some of these types of, of cancer or other medical conditions, not disabilities, but medical conditions that are in need of assistance. So I was wondering if you had any thoughts about how that might be brought into the program, or is it just politically not feasible at this time? Do you want to tackle that? <laughs> um, thank you, Mr. Martin, for the question. I also consulted um, your report, um, in inviting my report, so thank you so much for all your work. Um, so one of the criticism of U.S. assistance in Vietnam is that so far it has um, disregarded first-generation victims who were directly exposed to Agent Orange and, like you said, um, have well, chronic diseases, not disabilities. Right? So in Vietnam, there are support programs uh, for veterans. Uh, there are social uh, protection centers that provide health care and treatment for Vietnamese veterans, and many of those uh, are run by VAVA, right? So in Vietnam, there is that support system. And what I recommend in my report is for um, the US to support those existing infrastructure and system in Vietnam. Um, and you know, and I, I also talked to some of the veterans who received treatment in these facilities and they reported improved um, health uh, and they do, you know, do want to see those kind of services being expanded uh, to many other provinces. Um, so I, I think there's uh, an opportunity there for the US to uh, support this program. And also, by doing so, they also recognize the first generation victims of Asia Orange in Vietnam. Yeah, but I do think it is, there are a lot of political sensitivities about that and, and even, um, even on the disability side of things um, here, that we also have not brought up the, the problem of children of veterans in the US who have disabilities that they believe are impacted by Agent Orange. And so that 
Um, I think that kind of adds to, to the complexity because I mean, if we're working with the children who have disabilities in Vietnam who may be Agent Orange related, and now we're working with, the, with their parents or grandparents at this point, and we're still ignoring the population back here in the US, it, it gets kind of um, challenging politically, I think. I've asked myself the same question, that it's, it's interesting that US assistance is going mainly to people in second and following generations that are less definitively linked to Agent Orange, mm -hmm. whereas the first generation, which no one can dispute, they were exposed to dioxin, right? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, has, has not benefited uh, to the same extent. Uh, one reason may just be that USAID had existing disability programs and expertise in Vietnam that it could link this to. Tony says no. They did have that, I know. I worked on some of those programs earlier. But that, you don't think that's the reason? No, okay. No, not at all. Please, please come up to the mic, yeah. <laughs> well, I, uh, my name's Tony Kolb. I'm the uh, Deputy Director of our Reconciliation and Inclusive Development Office um, in Hanoi and uh, responsible for all the war legacy work uh, that USAID has been tasked with uh, taking on. Um, I'm, I'm back in Vietnam for a, a second four-year tour. I just started last November. I had previously worked on the Superfund cleanup uh, aspects of our, of our work in Da Nang and, and Benoit, and now I'm working more closely with our disabilities team. Um, I think the, the easiest way to connect uh, the focus on disabilities within the um, uh, the victims of Agent Orange support um, that we have currently is that there was from the beginning uh, the Leahy War Victims Fund, which focused a lot on injuries from um, unexploded ordnance, um, a somewhat safer area or, or a clearer area of cause and effect. Uh, you step on a mine or, or deal with uh, uh, an explosion, you know what caused your injury. So uh, there's no debate about uh, the potential role of dioxin, say, in uh, a stroke victim's uh, elderly uh, experience or uh, a child being born to somebody that um, perhaps was involved in the war. Uh, there's just, there's inherent un uncertainty because, you know, if it was certain, um, there would be many more victims. Mm -hmm. And it's simply, it, it's not, that's not the way the, the human body reacts to uh, environmental contaminants. Some bodies handle it very well, uh, and some are very sensitive to it. So, um, and we'll never know, really, the, uh, the, have the smoking biological gun, uh, per se. Um, but, you know, I, I really, frankly, don't know exactly the, the Vietnamese perspective on um, Agent Orange impacts and the focus on birth defects. Um, you know, I just assume that it comes from a, um, you know, a sense of catastrophic impact on, and, and somewhat clear impact from the, from the get-go. If you're born with uh, a, a congenital issue which is going to affect you the, uh, your whole life, you know, it's, it's a huge burden on any family. Um, and chronic illnesses come on slowly, they're associated with older age, um, you know, it's, I think it's just more accepted as that's life. Uh, I've had a rough life and I have to, to deal with it. Um, but when it happens to a child who's sort of an innocent victim, it's just m much more, it, you know, it, it hits you right there. You need to do something about it. And so, I, you know, I assume that that's one of the reasons that in the communications on this issue that it's always been a big focus. Uh, because I, I think it was the hope that it would spur action and, and response. And uh, I think it, it has. It's been successful in that way. Um, it's not that USAID has, has had no involvement. And in fact, uh, just in the last uh, year, uh, we've been getting strong interest from counterparts in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in particular and some other uh, realms to try to see what we could do to help on, on stroke care. Um, stroke later in life is associated with um, uh, dioxin exposure. Um, it has, you know, not, again, not a smoking gun. There's lots of other, you know, smoking in Vietnam uh, causes, uh, potentially. Um, but because it's affecting such a large number of uh, veterans currently, 
I, I think there's a great interest in seeing what can be done uh, to help. And we're, we're, we are currently starting some work with Bakwai Hospital, which is one of our oldest uh, partners in dealing with uh, the medical issues related to uh, dioxin exposure to, to try to um, encourage their efforts to establish better um, uh, quick response care to, to stroke to avoid disabilities. Mm -hmm. So we're sort of getting in a little bit in the, in the back door and saying that we're trying to prevent disabilities from occurring by uh, improved interventions in the early stages of stroke. Uh, in victims there and trying to spread that experience through the medical system in Vietnam. Um, I think I'm, I just comment on Laos a little bit. I mean, the, the big difference is that the Laotian, the Laotian government does not recognize um, Agent Orange as a problem. Um, and in fact, there's, I think, some active interest there in not talking about it because they don't want to create problems when they're, they don't see them. Um, so it's a little bit hard for us to cooperate with a, a bilateral partner if they don't see a problem. Uh, they typically come to us and want to work together on things that they self-define. So if, if uh, I think the exchange visit was very uh, helpful uh, between Laos and Vietnam to show some practical things that can be done to show improvement. And again, I think that's also the case in Vietnam when you show solutions to uh, a problem, you're going to get a lot more cooperation. Mm -hmm. um, so that, again, I, I think explains some of the uh, bias, potentially, in our assistance on disabilities towards the medicalized approach. Um, when you deal with rehab, it's a time-limited and results-orientated uh, intervention. And, you know, it's, if you don't rehabilitate to the best of your ability, there's no way that um, the caregivers are going to have an easier life or that the family is going to uh, potentially benefit economically from uh, a disabled individual's efforts. So rehab is sort of the, an, an entry point and, and a critical one and tailored to the type of money that we have, which is year by year. So we can, we can do something here try to leave behind an improved rehabilitation medical system that exists in Vietnam and is just weak. Um, when it comes to social support uh, interventions, the types of things that Susan talked about, those are more akin to uh, what we do for veterans, which is appropriations that are not gonna go away, they're gonna be there every year uh, to support our VA system. So our veterans know that you know, later in life you know, these benefits will be there. Um, we can't provide that to, to Vietnam. Um, we, we only have a small window of time to try to leave behind something uh, significant. And I just think in general that we have not been so very satisfied with the uh, short-term efforts to improve people's economic lives because we see those fail. And, and we see that's the way we work with poverty in America uh, we have benefits that are open to people over time because the challenges keep coming up. And especially when you have a disability, it doesn't really go away. You need, you need some level of assistance all the time. And this is the type of things that uh, VAVA, uh, hopefully everybody knows that acronym, it's the Vietnam um, Association for Victims of Agent Orange, a government program uh, to support this sort of long-term long assistance over time. Small amounts of money, um, but uh, they're, so, they're a resource there um, all the time. And we are not currently granting money to, to VAVA. Uh, it's very difficult for us regulatory-wise to give money to Vietnamese government uh, institutions um, because of some issues with financial transparency, which we're very sensitive to. Um, but we are trying to build their capacity so that they can play this role into the future um, and in and, and a better, in a more, uh, I guess, impactful way. So what we're, what we're doing is, is trying to share uh, the U.S. experience in dealing um, with these sorts of chronic issues of poverty and social support and, and try to share those uh, models and approaches which rely on leveraging government resources and civil society support because that exactly is what VAVA is. Um, 
full of retired uh, government people with strong connections, uh, but have a network of individuals down to the local level um, who volunteer their time to support um, their, their beneficiaries. And uh, we'd just like to see that be sustained and, and improve over time. Um, so we're, we're really proud of our, our partnership with them uh, because I think it reflects um, what I think for many of us has been a, a frustration on the ground to be um, sort of hiding this focus on victims of Agent Orange uh, under a, a basket of legal uh, risk that the U.S. government has felt, um, to be to have the space that um, uh, our leadership, like Ambassador Crittenbrink, uh, was able to, to do, to um, speak a little bit more directly to uh, what we know those in Congress want us to do, um, and have good partners in Vietnam to, to, to make that happen uh, is, you know, it's very satisfying now to be at that, uh, at that point. Um, so. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tony, for, for sharing. Um, Zoomer, Susan, do you have any closing comments? I think we're well, about at the No, but I mean, I think, I think there is more opportunity for USAID funding to get into this more non-medical side of things. I think it's challenging, but I think we're at a point now where we can start to find a way that, um, you're, you're right, you can't do it you know, without an ending. But I think there are ways that, that we can move into this field um, to at least just with some of the, the most immediate needs. Um, but I know there's a lot of constraints within USAID, even, even house construction and helping a family renovate a house. There's a, there's a whole level of, of layers of bureaucracy even to do something like that. So I think there's, there's ways that we can find. The best thing about Vietnam, I think, is there's always a way. You can always find a way um, to, to solve the problem. And the Vietnamese are very creative in doing that. So I think, I think there's openings here. Yeah, and to add to that, you know, just as we overcame the initial deadlock, right, I, I, I do, um, I, I'm confident that, you know, um, the two countries can again um, find a compromise and you know think of a pragmatic way uh, to advance uh, their cooperation. And I, I, I'm glad that you know there's great interest from both sides um, in um, enhancing the current programs and finding more ways to support people affected by Agent Orange. Great, thank you both. Uh, that concludes our roundtable. Congratulations again to both of you on publication of the reports and uh, recommend them to uh, everyone in the audience and online uh, to look in more detail. Thanks for being with us today. Thank you.